Um, so I, I start with this quote from Ernst Gombrich, who was a very important art historian. Their only artist just means that you have to look at the artist, not just at the art, which is a, a non-postmodern uh, frame of mind, meaning it doesn't matter what you, what, who did it, as long as you look at it and figure it out from there. So again, there's a duality between convention, which is background knowledge, things we agree about, and cognition. And cognition we can't change very much, because that's the way our brain works, so working memory. So I'm going to have some examples. One is a, a map, which is a famous map from New York from 1972 uh, that Massimo Vignelli designed, uh, which was very geometric, very beautiful, but it had some problems. And so in 1979, it was replaced by a more geographic, topographic map rather than topologic. And so this is pretty unique because actually most cities, you know, Paris, London, we'll see at the end, they are in fact geometric. But in New York, there were some problems. These are my uh, sort of references right now. Gombrich for art history, uh, De Saussure for linguistics, uh, founder of structuralism, and Badele is a, the current guy on memory. So this is Gombrich, and if you haven't read any of his work, I'd really uh, recommend it. So the psychological aspects of art and visual perception, and also the historical part. Jacques Bertin is a lesser known cartographer from France. He has a big tome called Semiology of Graphics. It's really more about cartography and data visualization, but it's part of the structuralist uh, tradition. And in his book, he has this thing where he says graphics is monosemic. Monosemic just means one meaning, and it's not true at all. I mean, every graphic can have more than one meaning. Um, some things are natural and instinctual, maybe the smile of a kid, but most things are constructs, uh, uh, cultural constructs. Um, so these, again, are my sort of two reference points. Badele is the current expert on so-called working memory, which used to be called immediate memory, short-term memory, and working memory is now the term. It's about two, three, four seconds. So when I'm talking to you, if I asked you now in a minute to tell me what I said a minute before, you're likely not to remember it because you just can't keep track of all that information. Uh, so working memory is very, um, it's very short and it, it's in constant uh, play with long-term memory. So when I'm talking to you, the reason you can understand me is because you already know all the words in the English language, more or less, what those mean. And you're able, so you're constantly going back to your long-term memory and you're taking it in from the environment, typically, right? Whether it's sound or vision. But that working memory window is in fact quite narrow, and it is a few seconds. So whenever you read something, whenever you look at something, you have to make sense of some of it, at least, in order to move on. Um, and that's true for print, for web, for anything. Um, so if you, if you know a lot about what you're looking at, then it's easier, right? You can quickly move forward. Uh, so if you're reading a complex text on math, uh, and you know all the concepts while well, you can move on, right? Uh, now, of course, learning means learning new stuff, so there's always going to be something you don't know, and that's how we, I guess, move forward. Uh, George Miller wrote a paper called The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, in 1956, and it's still the standard. That's where all this memory work started. He basically figured that you cannot remember more than five or six things within that short span of time. However, if you chunk those things, like a phone number, for example, or a social security number, then you can kind of put in a box a lot of things, and that becomes one item. Um, just some examples, a concept map or a mind map, in, mind map in place of a table of contents. I argue that that mind map is not a good map for the book. Uh, because it's not referring, because it's an abstract thing. Maps usually refer to concrete things, and, um, and it's always easier for us when we can refer to concrete stuff. Now, Chinese have an advantage. Chinese students have an advantage because words are very short, so they can do mental math much faster. They can, they can like, quickly do stuff because everything is much shorter. Um, here I talk about the fact that everything that's verbal, that rather that everything that's visual is also verbal because there's a language component. This is just a very schematic model of the working memory uh, system in which there is a visual system and a, and a 
you know, verbal system. So when I see a thing, let's say your eye, I immediately name that object and therefore I sub-vocalize it, which is also what we do when we read. We, um, we actually say the words even though we're not aware of them. So that obviously related to sound. So everything is visual, but it's also, everything that's visual is also verbal and everything that's visual is also temporal. Uh, because it takes time, nothing is instantaneous. This is just a reference to the Gecko, Geico advertisements because I believe the strength of those ads is in the sound, right? Gecko, Geico, it doesn't matter what the ad is. In fact, the ads are like super silly, but that's what you remember. Um, of course, in terms of conventions and background knowledge, context and uh, past experience counts. So everything that we see, according to sellers, uh, is past interpretation or post interpretation. So I see this house and I kind of know there is another side. So I kind of know, okay, that must be a house. And usually there's another side. So even though I don't see this side, I'm aware of it. Um, <clears throat> and it's also connected to a culture of a particular time because, you know, if a person from the Middle Ages were to look at this window, out this window and say, what are those things, you know, with wheels, right? Weird, small wheels. So everything, of course, it's contextual in time, not just in place. So the New York Times is a good example when it first came out because there were no photographs. Um, that's what the first issue looked like 160 years ago. Okay, all text. So, you know, if I got this, the paper today and I've subscribed, I would say, well, what's going on? You know, what happened to the pictures? Right, so that was normal. And one of my students actually replicated it in, uh, in my information design class to see what it would look like today if they just used text. <clears throat> um, is this a sign for a Jewish prayer service where the men and women have to be separated? Right, or is it a restroom? I mean, obviously we know it's a restroom, but you just never know, right? It just depends on what you already know, where you live. Uh, this is an exercise from a friend of mine in Milan who teaches a class and he plays with this idea. Let's put three people, two women, one man, three men, one woman, whatever. Um, meaning is very important. So when we perceive something, we always look for meaning. Here we see no meaning, right? Not that we can recognize. But here there is some meaning, right? Assuming that you know what these two acronyms mean. Um, and with, when you talk to someone, obviously you're always making assumptions. You always assume that they know at least some of the stuff you're talking about. If I say, you know, James Bond or 007, that triggers a whole bunch of other things. Beautiful women, you know, guns, uh, tuxedos, parties, what's that, whatever. Um, so, and that's an example of a chunk, by the way. James Bond is a chunk for a lot of other things. Um, so in terms of the context, again, the fact that everything really can be, can have more than one meaning. It's really, really, really rare that something just means one thing. My example is a punch in the face or, you know, whatever, something like that, where it's like there is no, um, there is no question what just happened, right? Uh, this is the classic duck or rabbit example. And you cannot see both. You cannot see the rabbit and the duck at the same time, even if you try. Uh, the same word, of course, can mean many different things. Miller uh, wrote a paper once about, he did a lot of work on linguistics too. So context, of course, will determine what that word might mean, right? If it's a golf course, it's a different, you know, it's a kind of shot. If it's, um, let's see what the next slide is. I kind of like this, that slides have to go. There you go. So it might be a, a rifle range, right? Or a target um, range. <clears throat> so when we talk, of course, you know, we always use words that could mean different things, but the context is going to tell you what the most probable meaning is. And, um, and by the way, this idea of the sound and the, the, the repeating the words is some exercise that I tell my students to do. Read what, you're say read what the poster is saying. This example just shows what was sent out into space. Assuming that these whatever are going to have eyes and they're going to tell, they're going to know what those things are. So we know this is Saturn and there's a symbol of that in the plaque, but what if they've never seen it? Um, you know, the guy's rising his hand 
and you know do the women not ever raise their hands I mean you know things like that uh, however there are some universals and Gombrich actually did point out to a few foreshortening that's a simple optics physics thing things get smaller to our perception when they're further away um, and so in, in pictorial representation of course I mean you can't get around that fact I mean that is that is a universal if something is far away you can kind of tell if something is far away if it's small right um, but then he also said you know there is no such a thing as like this art evolution these examples from 30,000 years ago were like already very developed um, perception when you see something and when you perceive something you're always constructing uh, an example is you know eyewitness are notably n always unreliable because you, can, you tend to introduce more stuff that you know um, another important aspect is how fast you can access that information that you already have uh, so to help that process you have to provide the viewer with like stuff uh, this is an example in which she highlighted the things that she didn't already know so 90% of that you already know when you read the paper you are actually giving already a lot of known information this is an example a great example of annotations every little bit is annotated um, so don't assume that people will know stuff Leonardo of course is a great example of taking notes for his own benefit mostly because you know he wasn't allowed to do this right he wasn't allowed to um, do uh, gross anatomy I guess uh, background is very background knowledge is very important this is an example in which new technologies such as 3D visualizations were introduced in a chemistry uh, lesson plan and yet the most impact, important factor was still the background knowledge about chemistry that the students had. So we're going to go back into maps and one map that is not in Bertin's book which is the semiology of graphics is this famous map, you might have already seen it, by a French um, guy who plots the uh, Napoleon's campaign, Russian campaign, all the way from France to Moscow and back. And so the line shows how many people he had at the beginning and how many people he had at the end. So it gets really thin because most of the soldiers die. But it's very abstract. And so the thing is, you cannot get that map unless you know, well, you should know who Napoleon is, right? And what those words really mean. So, in a sense, the map becomes much more meaningful if you have other experiences, other information that helps you, you know, what are all those deaths, right? Maybe you know all about the other wars from Napoleon. Um, so, it's an example of a map that's really, really cool and really beautiful, but only if you have all that background knowledge. Even though he actually explains, in the, in the legend he says, this is what you're supposed to read. There's like 800 people at the beginning and there is maybe you know, 2,000 people at the end. And at the bottom is actually a geographic version of it. Um, and there's just a little sidebar, uh, side box basically explaining that that line is just a simple um, bar chart that's been kind of like glued together. So it's a kind of a telescopic bar chart and the bars are actually symmetrically joined in the middle rather than being aligned at the bottom. Um, and we're used to reading bar charts. Uh, so back to the um, subway maps, uh, the one from 1972 and the one from 1979, and I actually happened to have them, no, I didn't bring it, but I have this map, that's my map from, I was actually in New York in 1978. Uh, so what they did, they just made it too abstract, right? I mean, it's just like, it took away everything. Uh, the water is gray, the land is, whatever color, and here in 79 the water is back blue. Um, and there's a lot of more information that even though it's not related to the subway per se, it helps you. So in 72 there is no central park, well rather there is, but it's not green, central park, it's like gray, and it's also square. So other things that they took out are like big landmarks. For example, there is no JFK in that map. And, you know, I kind of like to know that maybe a subway stop, like stops near the subway, I mean, near the airport. Um, he took out a thing, let's see, yeah, Roosevelt Island is gone. <laughs> Everything is on a grid, right? It was, a, the, you know, kind of rational is taken to an extreme. Um, <clears throat> I mean, somebody said, he took out the state earlier, somebody said, 
he always said, well, people are looking for subway stops, not landmark. Well, the opposite is true. People don't care about subway stops. They want to get to places, and the means of getting to places is through the subway stop. But they're not looking for this, right? I mean, it's like, okay, this is not very fun. Uh, what they're looking for is, the next slide, this is the same subway station underneath this place, which is uh, the skating ring at Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. Um, but well, I, I have to say, I love Vignelli for his like stubbornness, and he won't give up. And even today, he'll say, you know, one stop, one dot. Um, one reason why maybe in other cities it does work is very schematic, is because the geography, the topography, is much simpler. Both in Paris and London, you have a river that cuts right through, kind of horizontally. So you have above the river and below the river, and this is just you know a theory. Uh, New York is much more complicated. Whatever the reasons, though, I mean, it just people really did complain. So, you know, there must have been something there that wasn't quite, um, quite right. So people expect certain things. Now, maps have certain conventions, although they were not always the same as they are now. So, you know, the fact, for example, that the top is always north actually didn't used to be. Uh, a lot of the maps that were done in Europe before the Renaissance, I believe, or up to the Renaissance, actually had east of the top because, um, well, this idea of like moving up, right? And because Jerusalem was to the east, there are a lot of maps that have um, Jerusalem in the middle and it, they're oriented with the top being actually east which is weird, right? I mean, you think about it, you'd have to like reorient yourself completely. Uh, but just goes to show you that it doesn't, you know, it really has to do with time and place. And again, you know, I think it could have worked, but maybe it had too much. So water is gray, landings white in 1972. It did have one problem. Every train had a different color, which actually changed in the, in the later map where every tunnel, every truck had the same color. Uh, what was missing, though, is this sort of natural mapping between, you know, the object, the representation, and the physical reality. And the example with the stove is a classic problem of natural mapping, matching your burn, burner knobs with your burners, right? You all have this problem. Um, so the whole thing is really about, yes, form is important, and we teach, you know, typography, color, layout, whatnot. But I think we are neglecting a little bit how we actually perceive. Um, and so it's, you know, it's this idea of like, okay, methods are good, but also principles are good. Principles which are always uh, true. I mean, the working memory thing, those span of, of a few seconds, that's, that doesn't change. It doesn't change in probably a million years. So um, again, we also relate very well to concrete stuff. So in a geographic map, there is that concrete relationship. In a concept map, there isn't. And so that's why these are problematic. It's an abstract representation of an abstract concept. <clears throat> these are the people you should know about. Hebbinghaus came up with learning curve and distributed practice, which is the opposite of cramming. So Sir for linguistics, Bartlett for memory, and one example that history can kind of come back, it's actually being used now, the Vignelli map, to tell you what's not working, like what stations are problems, and that's an interactive version. So the whole thing about the fact that, you know, everything depends. Everything is context, history, um, and not just the form. And those count for a lot. So everything is uh, everything has to be ad hoc, right? Everything has to be kind of okay. Let's see what happens. Um, you have to you have to work around you know those constraints. Um, and uh, that's it. I missed. I didn't write the word thank you. Everybody else at the conference had the big thank you at the last slide, and I realized I didn't. But um, so that's it. So you have the handout, which has a link to all the slides, if you wanted to like download the original slides, um, and the paper too, if you're curious. So this was like a 5,000 word paper, and you can download the PDF, uh, more or less, you just have to navigate in the website. And, um, and I did record myself there, but I haven't yet laid over the audio track onto the slides, so at some point I'll do that.
Thank you.